there's not much of an argument when the conversation comes up about who the best competitive snowboarder of all time is. The one name you're guaranteed to hear is Sean White. And I've had the privilege of coaching Sean the last few years while he was on a mission attempting to win his third Olympic gold medal. And this was special to me because Sean and I have some history together. When he was 15 and I was 20 years old, we were competing against each other for the same spot on the US Olympic halfpipe team. It came down to the final event in the very last runs. I ended up beating him that day and stamped my ticket to the 2002 Winter Olympics. But unfortunately for me, this would turn out to be the very last time that I'd ever beat him. But nonetheless, it happened, and we have an ongoing joke that I helped him in the beginning by motivating him. And now I get the chance to help him near the end of his career as his coach. Throughout my career, first as an athlete and now as a coach, I've come to believe that there's three simple principles that if followed can help anyone achieve their goals. Sean White's epic comeback at the last Winter Olympics demonstrated these three principles to a T. And today I'm gonna to share them with you. The story starts on October 21st, 2017. Five months before the Winter Olympics, we were training in New Zealand and he was down there working on two specific tricks in the half pipe, back to back 1440s. So that's when a snowboarder leaves the lip of a half pipe, flips twice, spins four and a half times, lands switch, goes up the next wall, does the same thing, and lands perfectly. That's like Tiger Woods teeing off on hole one right-handed like normal, 300 yard drive down the middle, and then getting up to hole two and have to go left-handed. Not easy. But we both knew and agreed that if he could master this combo, his chances for gold would be sky high. And the day started great. He was doing the first 1440 over and over, probably did six of them in a row. We were having our best day yet. Then he looked at me and said, hey, I want to try the other one. I said, let's get it. This is the day. 30 seconds later, he leaves the half pipe, flips twice, spins four and a half times. And when he's coming into land, he looked perfect in the air. When he's coming into land, he unexpectedly hit the deck of the half pipe with his board and butt, just like this, boom, which sent him falling down 22 feet to the bottom where the ice wall caught his toe edge and he slammed his chest and face right into the ice. Boom! Goggles explode, helmet pushes back, blood everywhere. Luckily, I was standing right on top of the deck, right above him. I slid down to him and he's going, my teeth, I knocked my teeth out. And as gruesome as this sounds, I was actually relieved that he was talking and conscious and wondering where his teeth were. So I got to him, I assessed the damage and I said, Sean, breathe, your teeth are there, just take some breaths. But the truth is I couldn't see his teeth, all I saw was blood. But I had to tell him anything I could in that moment to make him feel better and try and calm him down. Right then I heard someone go, put some pressure on it. I look up from where I slid in the half pipe and there was Dan Bilzerian, a celebrity who now lives in Los Angeles, California. He was on vacation at the time in New Zealand. He saw us and he knew just what to do. He has a military background, so he threw a towel in the pipe. Sean put it on his face. The ski patrol arrived. Next thing I knew, he was getting flown off in an emergency helicopter for surgery. I was positive when I was watching that helicopter fly away that I was watching his Olympic goals and possibly his whole professional career fly away with it. It was that bad of a crash. A few days later, we were in the hospital and he was healing up. They did a great job of stitching him back up, but we couldn't leave. It turned out when he fell on the ice, he put a huge contusion on one of his lungs and his chest was filled with blood, so he couldn't fly home. So we had to sit in this hospital and think about what happened. How did we go from the best day ever to the absolute worst? And what did the future look like? The Olympics were only five months away. So I thought it was a good time to have a necessary but very difficult conversation with him. I said, Sean, you of all people have nothing to prove. You don't ever have to risk your health again if you don't want to. No one would ever think twice. He looked at me and he said, what's the point of all this? I can't quit now. I've come too far, I've worked too hard. 
I cannot stop. And right then, I understood who he was and why he's had all the past success he has had. He thought two seconds about it and said, no way, I can't quit. And this is such an important thing to take note of. But there's one thing I can guarantee everyone in this room or the whole world, anyone who has lofty goals or ambitions, I can guarantee you, you will want to quit at least once, probably twice, three times, and you'll have great excuses. But the bottom line is persistence pays and wins every time. The person who wants it the most gets it. It's that simple. And that's what he more or less told me that day in that room. He said, I can't stop. I said, okay, well, let's get home, try and recover and reassess. Seven weeks later, we're back in Colorado, and it's time to now qualify for the Olympics. No one's given a freebie for the team. You have to earn it, even Sean. So he goes out to the first qualifying events and gets a third place. For his standard, that's not great, but considering he had stitches in his tongue and his confidence was shattered compared to where it was before the crash, we were happy about it. But now it's the holidays. December 25th through January 2nd, the whole industry takes a break. Everyone goes home and just decompresses. If they snowboard, it's for fun. They hang out with the family. He looked at me and he said, hey, are you thinking what I'm thinking? I said, what's that? He's like, I, I can't take a week off. I can barely take a day off. He's like, I'm gonna fly home and come right back. I know it's the holidays and you have a family, so I don't expect you to come. If you do, that'd be great. But if not, no worries. I said, Sean, I love your attitude. I'm gonna do everything I can to get on that flight with you. And that's what we did. We flew back and spent the holidays hiking a half pipe in Colorado. He showed up when no one else wanted to. He sacrificed his whole holiday and put in the work. And showing up is an art form that I think is worth mastering or at least trying to. Sunny days, windy days, sick days, sad days, it doesn't matter. Showing up buys you insurance for when that big opportunity comes that you'll be ready. Finals day, test day, you name it. Not a lot of people like doing it, but it seriously buys you insurance. So much so that when the next event came in January, he won it. He was getting his confidence back and now he stamped his ticket to the 2018 Winter Olympics. So now he could start thinking about that gold again. On the flight over February 1st to the Winter Olympics, he looks at me and he says, this is the most unprepared I've ever been for a Winter Olympics. Now as his coach, that hurt a little, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I tried not to take it too personal though. And I said, Sean, given five months ago, we were talking retirement, you're doing pretty good. And the reason he was stressing out is because he still hadn't mastered that combination of the 1440s back to back that he knew he was going to need to probably win gold. But I said, Sean, we have a huge week of practice when we get there. Show up like you always do. Let's put in the work, see what happens. I pushed him that week and he responded, still didn't get the back to back 14s, but he rode really well and his confidence was sky high. When qualifying day came, he won the event. And this is big because whoever qualifies first at the Olympics goes last on finals day. There's three runs on finals and the top place qualifier is last to go. So if you're not in first, you know what you need to do. That was the good news. The bad news, finals was the very next day. For whatever reason, you typically get a break. It goes qualities, break, finals. So you have a day to relax, mentally recover the whole nine. We woke up on finals and even I was tired, but I didn't show it. We ate breakfast and I go, Sean, how you feeling? He looked at me and he said, this is my worst nightmare. He said, my leg is trashed. My back hurts. I'm not feeling it. It's cloudy outside. Any ideas? And I was a coach when your star athlete says, this is his worst nightmare on the big day. That's not good, of course, <laughs> but, <laughs> But I was so proud of him that he had the courage and the wisdom to reach out. There's so much power that comes in being able to reach out when you need it. And Sean is better at this than anyone. Good things happen when you reach out. There's not one person on this planet that can't use little help sometimes. You get a new perspective. 
maybe a sense of humor, or maybe that push out the door you needed that day. And I've been there myself, so I said, Sean, let's get going. Let's get the boots on. We'll get outside. The fresh air will hit us. You'll feel good, I swear. Adrenaline will get you through the day. Let's just get moving. That's what he did. He said, all right. We got outside, got, got to practice. It wasn't a good practice for him either. By his standards, it was pretty poor, but he kept chipping away. He didn't give up. Every run, he got a little better, and the energy was building. By the time first run came, he went from practicing here to performing up here. I thought he won on his first run, but it's never that easy. By the time third run came, another competitor more or less did the same 1440s that he was wanting to do and bumped him to second place. So now it's third and final run, and he has to do something he's never done before. We had our talk, got in our zones, and I know Sean's a gamer, he likes pressure, so I knew he had a good chance. I saw the red light from the camera come on, and he drops in with a lot of speed, goes into the first hit, boom, huge frontside 1440 to the moon, lands perfect. Now he's in uncharted territory, he's going into something he's never done, same trick that put him in the hospital. Leaves the lip, flips twice, spins four and a half times, lands like he never left. Two elephants were on my back, one just jumped off. But he still had to finish the run. So then he goes a huge frontside 540 stale fish, real stylish move, kind of catch your breath, into two back-to-back -back 1260s at the bottom, the best ones he's ever done. He puts his hand up. We start hugging and crying at the top. We're freaking out because we knew what he overcome mentally and physically to get there and do it at that time. We were losing it. Then we pulled out our phones for the live scoring. The second elephant flew off my back. Gold medal. He did it. Now these three principles that I use as the foundation for my coaching philosophy are now yours. Show up, reach out, and never, ever give up. Your persistence will pay. Good luck.